The good news today, and I would recommend you do it, is no matter what I say or any pastor says, it should be according to the Word of God. Amen? You have the privilege to study your Bible and to know truth for yourself. You don't have to rely on a pastor. Now, it's helpful sometimes maybe to hear some of those things, but... We shouldn't forsake the assembling, but you should be reading your Bible outside of here because really this is what changed everything. Martin Luther got a hold of a Bible. It was chained because they didn't want anybody to take it. But he read that thing and he read it. He read the book of Romans. He, he decided that, wow, this is amazing. And he decided he had to say something about it. Isn't that how you feel when you just got the best news ever? I mean, I was pretty excited to share what God did with God's closet up here because I'm excited about it. When you're excited about what God's done and when you realize the gift of salvation, there should be an excitement to share it. So we see God's reformation plan. So he re-puts Christ is the sacrifice. He reinstitutes baptism that he will wash away all of our sins. He will provide daily bread. There should be a prayer revival. People should be praying consistently. There's seven candlesticks in there. It has seven branches on the candlesticks. Perfect prayer, consistent, complete prayer. God's people become the light of the world because we have God in us. And God's remnant keep the law of God. We can go right straight to Revelation chapter 12 to see this fulfilled. And so we find in some of these early reformers, they brought about little elements of truth. And I don't know if you know who all these reformers are, but I want to share just a short synopsis of what happened in the Reformation and a few of the figures. The first one was John Wycliffe. He translated some of the first versions of the Bible into English. Wycliffe was an early critic of the papacy and clerical power. He placed greater emphasis on Scripture. And you'll find this over and over. They all placed a huge emphasis on Scripture, advocating Bible-centered Christianity. Amen? This is what the world needed to hear, is we need to be a people about the Word of God. I don't think it's so different today. His followers were known as the Lullards and were precursors to Martin Luther. So he was an early reformer. The one came after him, John Huss. Um, he was a, a Czech theologian who propagated the radical reforms of Wycliffe and was a key figure in later Protestant Reformation. He also saw problems and heresy, and he was burnt for saying something about it. His teachings uh, made a spread all across the Czech area because he brought people once again back to the Word of God. One of the fascinating things about Huss... He came just before Martin Luther, and he had a vision, you might say a God-appointed dream, that pictured what was going to happen in the Reformation. I don't know if you've heard of it, but as he was in prison, an amazing thing happened. Let me, I don't know if you can read that up there, it's kind of fine print. It says, one night, the holy martyr saw in imagination from the depths of his dungeon, so he was already in prison, sentenced to death. The pictures of Christ that he had painted on the walls of his oratory, meaning his sermons painted a picture of Jesus. And as he painted these pictures of Jesus, he walked in and saw his church that he was used to, and there were paintings showing his sermons, if you will, in picture. It says, affected, but they were effaced by the Pope and his bishops. The popes were trying to get rid of it. The vision distressed him. But on the next day, he saw many painters occupied in restoring these figures in greater number and in brighter colors. As soon as their task was ended, the painters who were uh, surrounded by an immense crowd exclaimed, Now let the popes and bishops come. They shall never efface them more. And many people rejoiced in Bethlehem, and I with them, and John Huss. It says, Busy yourselves with your defense rather than with your dreams. And he goes on, but the idea that happened here, what happened in this, is he got a picture of, yes, he was beginning restoration. He was pointing people back to the Word of God. People were reading the Word of God in little bits and pieces. And it's not that the Word of God was extinct through the Dark Ages. There were people, there were the Waldensians, sewed it into their jackets and went about risking their lives to share it. Many died because of it. But when it came to these people... He pointed them back to this. And those pictures 
went and they just got bigger and brighter and more accurate through. And this becomes important, as you'll see. So we have what some people have called the great middle reformers. Martin Luther's considered the father. Sorry for the short history lesson, if all of you know this, but... Uh, Martin Luther, he sought to reform the Roman Catholic Church when he felt it had been corrupted and lost its original focus. So he was a key figure. He, he did the 95 Thesis. If you haven't read it, it's a very interesting read. But he saw problems. Now, let me ask a, a question that might make some people uncomfortable. If we saw things going wrong in our own church, should we say something? Yes. Amen. You should. If you see something, if you hear me preach something, you say, that doesn't sound right, please come see me. We want to be a people of the book again. Amen? Amen. We should be a people about the Word of God. That's what Martin Luther was all about. People came along after him. Zwingli came in. Um, he was in Switzerland and Europe. He was in that statue at the very beginning. He also... Um, proposed many reforms to the Catholic Church based on the primacy of the Bible and influenced by his Renaissance learning and the works of Erasmus. So he went in and he changed. All of these people were playing little different roles as they changed all over. John Calvin, many people are familiar with him. Um, I think he did in some ways more damage than good sometimes. Um, he created a, a different theology. The once saved, always saved comes from Calvin. He believed that God's love was so big and so great that if He chose you to be saved, there was nothing you could do to be lost. Well, that's a grand idea. It's true that God loves you, and there's nothing you can do to separate you from God's love. God will always love you no matter how bad you get, no matter what happens, but you can separate yourself from God. God will give you free choice, and we can be saved, and then we can move away from God so much that we are no longer in that position. So there were problems, and as we see some of these reformers, they didn't get it all together. Each of them had elements of truth. Martin Luther, it's interesting because he, he was so big on separating church and state that the church should have nothing to do with hurting people, killing people, things like that. He was against that. Well, that was true for a while. But when they first got to the uh, Anabaptists, the dis Anabaptists that wanted to baptize people by immersion and believed in rebaptism, he said, no, these people are crazy, drowned them. The first Anabaptist that was self-proclaimed, they took him out and they dropped him in the river with a stone attached to him to curse him for his blasphemies. And Martin Luther was okay with that. So they had trouble. They had things wrong, but they restored elements of truth. Then we get to some of the later reformers. Tyndale was one of the first people to print the Bible in English, which we're thankful for him. That's one of the reasons we can have it now. He worked in translating the Bible into English, even, it was, even when it was deemed to be illegal. He was executed because of it um, and taken to Henry VIII. Um, so his English Bible was then taken to Henry VIII and it got out. Um, but he also preached the mortality of the soul. So meaning that when your, your spirit doesn't live on forever and ever, when you die, you sleep. Interesting that it goes clear back to Tyndale. You have other reformers such as Arminius. We're Armenian, if you didn't know that, in some ways in our theology. He uh, opposed Calvin and predestination, that we're just destined to be saved or destined to be lost. So we can thank him for that, that exercise of free will in the process. And he also developed a, a reaction um, to all this. He believed we needed to have a personal relationship with God. I'm just going to cruise through these. William Rogers, if you don't know who he is, he started the Baptist church uh, with another man, and he had a strong stance on separation of church and state. Uh, calling, he was a founder of the colony of Rhode Island. We have John Wesley, which the founder of Methodism. We have a lot in common with the Methodists, if you didn't know, as well. And he came about the holiness movement, that God, we don't just accept him and then he's done with us. God accepts you no matter who you are, but he loves us enough that he doesn't leave us that way. He wants us to be better people. Have you ever heard that? So he was all about this. So Wesley came on this stage and he really, uh, he said faith and reason need to be there. There should be an experience of salvation. In his own words, it says uh, the message that everyone could have a personal relationship with God was key to his theology. 
Isn't that true for us? God was trying to message, get a message across from people to people to people. So we find that the Reformation continues through these people. Then we get down to 1844 and William Miller. William Miller, most of us know who those are. He discovered the 70-week, 1260-day, and 2300 days of prophecy, all kind of concluded in October 22, 1844. The Advent movement was a trans-denominational, didn't matter where you were at, went around the world, and it was people coming back to realize, you know, those books of Daniel and Revelation, it's not just a bunch of crazy nonsense and scary beasts. There's actually something to it. It was predicting things. It was just an apocalyptic language. And then you come to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Ellen White. She's considered one of the most prolific authors and American Christian pioneer. She became the prophetic voice to Adventism, foretelling the completion of the Reformation. All these people brought elements of truth, and we can be thankful for every one of them. So if I were to take Ivor Myers, he looked through this and he said, yep, the, the Lollards really brought back through Wycliffe the Word of God. That symbolized the table of showbread. Then kind of um, over uh, down at the bottom, you have Martin Luther coming back to pointing us back to Christ as our sacrifice. Then you have Calvin bringing us back to, he focused a lot on prayer and God's intercession, our intercessor versus the priests. You have four, you have Roger Williams and the Baptist. Obviously, they came in play for reviving baptism by immersion, biblical baptism. You have Wesley and the Methodists, that we were to be a light to people by living holy lives. And Seventh-day Adventist movement comes at the end to restore the law of God. So if we were to look at that, could you say the Reformation is complete? Has God brought back truths that were lost through the dark ages and restored them in the truth of who he is and the truths he wants to proclaim? Some might say yes. He has restored these ideas that you and I are privileged to have. But in many ways, the Reformation isn't complete because, to be honest with you, Reformation doesn't come without revival. The two go hand in hand. To reform something does little good if the people aren't excited about what you're doing, right? So when Reformation came, when people got back into the Word of God, when they started praying like they'd never prayed because their lives depended on it, and in fact, many of them died at the stake, they were fed to lions, all kinds of horrible things, and they went to their death singing praises to God. Because they had a firm knowledge that they were saved in Jesus Christ. They got back to the Word of God and they said, it doesn't matter. I've got Jesus. If I've got Jesus, I've got everything I need in the Word of God. And so there was a restoration of this. And we find this thing is true with us. What is our path? Well, our path is the same in the sanctuary as well. It comes with we must accept Christ's Atoning sacrifice, Romans 10, 9. We must be baptized according to John 3, 3 and through 5. We must eat the word of God. We, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to be a people doing this. Otherwise, God's restoration of his image in our lives is incomplete. Amen? God wants to restore. You have to realize this restoration isn't just a big corporate thing where we get all our doctrines right. If you've got all your doctrines right, does that save you? No, it doesn't. You can know all the truth about the Bible and still be completely lost because you don't know Jesus personally. You have no prayer life. You have no devotional life. You have no knowledge of him, just a bunch of facts about him. That isn't what saves us. And so it's more than that. It's about studying and gaining a personal relationship. It's about revival. It's about letting God come into our lives, work in us and through us in mighty and powerful ways. It says, we, so we must eat the word of God. We must pray. We should have an active prayer life. We must let our light shine before men. Matthew 5, 16, we must keep his commandments. All of these things pointed us to Really, revival starts here, me. 
It's okay to pray for corporate revival, but I don't think you're going to see it unless you start with you. When you pray for revival, you need to be praying for yourself. And the reality is, I don't think the Reformation is complete in our lives. In fact, I'm pretty certain of it. I know it's not done because we're not all just like Christ, are we? No, it doesn't take very much. We don't have to look around. We can just look right here, right? We're not perfect. This is a, um, oh, that was supposed to be, whoop. Nope, that's not it. Okay, I lost the last quote. I have one quote uh, that kind of summarizes this. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, it says, from Christ Objects Lessons, it says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. So what is Christ waiting for? Us. He wants us to look like Him because we're so focused on Him by beholding we become changed. When, we, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own is the promise we have. You see, we have a work of reformation to do in our own lives. God is calling us to look more like Him. Very plain and simple. So the reformation is not complete individually. It is complete in that he restored the doctrines and you now have no excuse. I didn't get a single amen, sorry. <laughs> Was pausing for it to come. <laughs> we have the truth, don't we? Is the truth not in the Word of God? Do we not know our scriptures? If you don't know them, it's time to study them. If you've never studied them, don't know how to study them, feel like it just confuses us, come see me. We have study guides that can help you, guide you in the process. God wants to restore His image in you. And the reality isn't because, it's not just because He wants to do that because that will make Him happy. He wants to do it because it may, will make you happy. It will bring you joy unspeakable. It will make you ready for heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven, right? Right? The kids all raised their hands. I didn't look behind me. Everybody here want to go to heaven? It's an easy thing. Accept Christ and then keep accepting Him. Keep letting Him lead your life every single day. If we live in Christ, if we live in a connection with Him, it doesn't matter what happens. Even if you don't reach that perfection, we sometimes say. And by the way, you know, if you get into this idea of perfection... If you look in Matthew, it says you should be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. Anybody ever read that and got scared? Let, let's be honest. <laughs> it makes me a little nervous. I want to remind you, look at the parallel passage in Luke. I don't have these on the screen because it just came to me. But the passage in Luke, it says, Be ye merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. God wants us to be full of mercy. When you are merciful and loving towards others, did he not say they shall know you by your love? Paul says love is the fulfillment of the law. God was trying to point us to that we need to be the most loving people on this planet. We need to be the most generous people on the planet. We should be giving of our time, of our resources. And I'm not up here begging for your money, but we should just do this because this is what God is impressing. I want God to be the one to impress you. Because when you have that conviction, it's pretty hard to ignore. If you ignore it, you'll learn to regret it. Because it eats at you like a cancer. Don't turn away from God. God has a work to do in your life. God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of you. And He wants it to be restored like His image in you. Can we do that? Can we say we are going to let the Reformation continue in our lives starting today? Yes, it's been 500 years and it's not done yet in a sense because we're not following it. Let it be today that we make a decision that I'm going to go back to the Word of God. I'm going to read it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to learn it and I'm going to practice it. Amen. Amen? Amen? Well, let's sing then. Our closing song is Give Me the Bible. Because really, that's what we need. We need to get back to the Word of God. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, we were known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the past as a people of the book. And Lord, that needs to be true again today. We need to be a people that are about the Word of God. 
a people that immerse themselves in not just knowing the facts of the Bible, but applying it to our lives. Pleading for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and personal revival, Lord, because we need revival and reformation. Lord, we need our lives to look like you. And Lord, thank you that you don't settle for who we are now, that you want to make us better, happier, more joy-filled Christians. People that just have a smile that can't seem to be wiped away. We want to be those people. We want to be those generous, loving, giving, amazing people that let your light shine. That when people see us, they can tell we have spent time with you. Lord, that can only happen when we truly spend time with you. So, Lord, help us to do that. If we've let our devotional life slip, if we've lost sight of you in any way, Lord, forgive us. And I'm so grateful that when we come to you and recognizing we've made mistakes, we may have stepped away, slipped away somehow, Lord, you always accept us. You always forgive us, and then you point us back on your path. So, Lord, do that for your people today. May the commitments people are making in their hearts be ones that they can stand true, Lord. Let the enemy not come anywhere near them, but may they be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that their work is not in vain if it is in you. So, Lord, thank you so much for restoring the image of God through the doctrines. Restore it now in us is our plea. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath.